relationships, I find. If you can cook with another person, you know, that is an ultimate test of compatibility. I urge you to be creative and imaginative, you know, not to be locked into any intellectual scheme for eating, to improvise. You know, I love being able to uh, go into somebody's kitchen and prepare a meal, just whatever's there, you know, to take whatever's there and make something. Or, or to go into a food store with no idea of what I'm going to make and just based on what looks good or what's aptly fresh to decide I'm going to take that home and cook it. And, you know, this is a very powerful way that you can influence the health of your whole family. So I urge you to, you know, if, you, if you're scared of cooking, if you feel like you don't have time for it, you know, experiment because it is really possible not only to learn to make healthy food but to make healthy food that's easy. You know, I hate cookbooks that, with recipes that don't work, especially if they're incredibly time-consuming and use all sorts of strange ingredients. You know, I really like things that are easy to make and delicious and healthy. And again, all that's possible. I get a lot of questions about different cooking methods, things like our microwave oven safe and so forth. I'll just answer a, a few of these common questions. You know, microwaving is very convenient for defrosting food rapidly or rapidly heating food. I don't think it's a safe method for long cooking because there is some evidence that microwaving actually changes the chemistry of food, especially proteins, and may produce altered molecules that aren't so good for us. And, and, and anyway, it's not a great method of cooking. The, the results of it are not terrific. So I think you should keep microwaves for very short-term, rapid heating of food. And I hope you all know that you should never microwave in anything other than ceramic or glass because microwaves can drive plastic molecules into food. So you never want to microwave anything in plastic wrap or plastic containers. They're just a useful thing to know about. So I'd like you to try to think of yourself as an alchemist in the kitchen, that you're taking the best possible ingredients and combining them and transforming their qualities into qualities that are going to be most helpful for you and are going to promote longevity and happiness. You've heard that fat is bad for you, or is it carbohydrates, not fat, that are the root of all evil? If you're a vegetarian, everyone wants to know where are you getting your protein. Let me help you figure this out. I'm going to talk to you about the macronutrients. That word means the big foods. They are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. These are primarily sources of caloric energy. In addition, protein has specialized function uh, for providing other molecules that the body needs. I'll start with carbohydrates because these are the simplest foods. When plants capture sunlight, they use it to bind molecules of water and molecules of carbon dioxide together, and they use that solar energy to forge the chemical bonds to put those into a molecule of glucose. The most specialized cells in the body are brain cells. The brain, its preferred food is glucose. Under certain conditions, it can be forced to burn other things. But for practical purposes, the brain needs a constant, steady supply of blood sugar. If that stops, for any mo within a very short time, unconsciousness will result. The brain is totally dependent on a steady supply of glucose. Now, in America especially, nutritionists have been stuck in what is now a very outmoded way of viewing these carbohydrate foods. And we have been told that it's good to eat complex carbohydrates and not so good to eat too much simple carbohydrate. That is a meaningless distinction and a very unuseful way of viewing carbohydrate foods. There is a newer way of looking at them that has become very popular in science in Europe and in other parts of the English-speaking world and I hope it will begin to catch on in America. And that is that rather than looking at whether carbohydrates are simple or complex, sugars or starches, to look at how fast different carbohydrates are converted to blood sugar. This can be measured and rated in a quantity called the glycemic index that you have probably heard of. And it is a much more useful way of understanding carbohydrates and understanding their relative effects on our health. When a carbohydrate food is digested, it is turned by the body into glucose. But the rate of doing that is influenced by many different factors. One is the chemical nature of the carbohydrate. Another one is the mechanical nature of the food. Uh, for example, when you take a starch, such as the starch in grains of wheat, and mill it to an extremely fine powder, flour, 
you create an enormous surface area for enzymes to work on. So there is a huge difference between putting a grain of wheat in your stomach or a cracked grain of wheat in your stomach and putting a product made from white flour. There is a much, much faster conversion of a flour product to blood sugar. When blood sugar rises, this creates problems for the body. High levels of sugar in the blood are extremely toxic. And the body has to get rid of them very quickly. The higher the glycemic index of a food, and there's an arbitrary scale in which glucose is given a, a, a arbitrary number of 100, and anything lower than that is converted to blood sugar more slowly. Generally, if something has a glycemic index under about 55 or so, we say it has a low glycemic index. Um, a lot of the carbohydrate foods that we eat in our culture are very high glycemic index carbohydrates. But, you know, there are some surprises here. Sugar, common table sugar, sucrose, consists of a molecule of glucose linked to a molecule of fructose, fruit, su fruit sugar. The body has a very limited ability to metabolize fructose, so it has a very low glycemic index. And the combination of those two molecules put table su sugar kind of in the intermediate range. So this is the food, you know, we've heard that this is a simple carbohydrate, it's supposed to be not good. But actually, the glycemic index of table sugar is not that great. On the other hand, the glycemic index of a rice cake, which many people think of as an austere diet food, is very, very high because of the chemical nature of the starch and the fact that these grains are puffed and exploded. So again, there's a huge surface area for enzymatic digestion. Eating a lot of high glycemic index foods seems to correlate in, in many people, not all, but in many people, with obesity, with hypertension, with an increased tendency to develop adult onset diabetes, and a condition called insulin resistance in which the body becomes less sensitive to the effects of insulin. Uh, this syndrome is common, but not universal. There are estimates that 25 to 30 percent of our population may be sensitive to carbohydrates in this way, and more of us might be intermediately sensitive. But the bottom line here is that the glycemic index of carbohydrates is something to pay attention to and learn about. Now, if you've read the anti-carbohydrate literature that's out there, of which there's plenty today, you know, there's a lot of voices telling us that we shouldn't eat carbohydrate foods, that these are dangerous. And they use this information about glycemic index, but it's distorted in a lot of these books. For one thing, many of these writers fail to point out that there are differences in these categories of even relatively high glycemic index carbohydrate foods. For example, many of these writers put bread and pasta into the same breath. But in fact, pasta has a significantly lower glycemic index than bread because it's not puffed and exploded like that by the action of yeast. And you can reduce the glycemic index of pasta even further by cooking it al dente in the Italian manner. You know, if, if Americans go to Italy, often the pasta we're served there seems undercooked. But it's good to learn to like pasta that way because the, the denser core of the pasta is less susceptible to the action of digestive enzymes, so there is a slower conversion to blood sugar. So I think the fact that carbohydrates are such simple foods that the body can so easily get energy from. The fact that the brain really depends on a steady supply of glucose for its life and function, to me, suggests that these are very valuable elements of the diet. And I think to cut out carbohydrates or to reduce them down to very low levels is not healthy long term. One of the worst things out there that I have a lot of concerns about are products sweetened with high fructose corn syrup, which is ubiquitous now. You know, this is a, the, in early in the century, food manufacturers learned to make a sweet syrup from corn. Originally, they did it th through a purely chemical method, and now it's done through a, an enzymatic process that produces a syrup that's very high in fructose. Manufacturers love this. This is in everything. If you start reading labels, it's in all, you know, fruit juices, syrups, jellies, jams, and so forth. It's cheaper than, than sucrose, and it's sweeter. But, you know, as I said to you, the body has a very limited ability to handle fructose. Uh, you can maintain life with intravenous glucose, but if you try to give somebody intravenous fructose, very quickly it produces very serious liver dysfunction and death. In terms of how much carbohydrate people should eat, my recommendation is that it should be about 50 to 60 percent of total calories. I think that is a healthy range of carbohydrate to eat. 
Let me go on to talk about fat. There has been, I think, tremendous misinformation 